Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're actually starting about 30 seconds early, according to that clock over there, but I never know what clock to, what clock to follow. Um, did everybody hear me all right? I'm told I have a voice that projects well, so if you can't hear me, move closer or something. Uh, my name is Kurt Olson, and uh, I uh, used to attend Chrysler Rock, attended here from the 90s to 2005. In 2005, my wife and I moved to a little town called Almond, Wisconsin. It's a Plainfield area, south of Stevens Point, about, about a half an hour. And um, for now, it's been about 20 years, I've been doing a <coughs> study of the early church. Just a personal study, just something that I was interested in. What did the early church, uh, what did they have that we might be missing today? Why were they so powerful? Why were they able to you know, turn the world upside down? And um, about three years ago, uh, it seems like the Lord decided that I graduated from that study, and uh, he started sending me to teach other people what I learned over those last 17 and now 20 years. Uh, since that time, I have uh, conducted trainings in, in biblical discipleship um, all over the world. I've been to uh, Southeast Asia, I've been to the Middle East, I've been to South America, Central America, Caribbean, several places in the United States, and what's really neat is that um, when I go teach people what the early church had, people tend to start to put that into practice in their own lives. And so just in the last 20 years, we've seen, um, I've seen over 20,000 disciples of Jesus Christ uh, develop in multiplying movements of uh -huh. disciples in different places around the world. And these are people who don't know my name, uh, they, they're people who are being led to Christ and are being taught how to lead others to Christ and to become obedient disciples of Jesus Christ uh, without, without ever, like I said, ever meeting me. It's just the folks who got trained who go out and teach people to be disciples who make disciples who make disciples, which some people call a disciple-making movement. Maybe you've heard that term that's kind of a, a, a term that's popular today in the world. And um, there's a lot of different disciple-making movements uh, in the world today. In fact, um, in fact, the world, there, there, there's something new, it seems like, that's, that's happening in the world today. And uh, it, it involves movements of disciples who make disciples uh, of Jesus Christ. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. And... Um, one of the areas in which we see disciple-making movements taking place is the Muslim world. And, you know, on the news, you don't hear about that. In the news, you don't hear about Muslims coming to Christ. You, you, you hear all the atrocities or, you know, bad things that are happening in the name of Islam. But in actual fact, there are many, many Muslims coming to Christ in the world today. In fact, there was a historian, a guy who wrote a book, called uh, A Wind in the House of Islam. Anybody, anybody read that book or hear of that book? It's a book that um, came out just a few years ago. And the guy who wrote it was a, is a historian, went around the world, and he looked at the history of Islam, and he looked for times when Muslims have turned to Christ in numbers more than a 1,000, uh, where they led themselves to Christ. So not where you know they were being forced converted, but where they actually wanted to embrace Jesus Christ. And um, in the 1800s, he found one movement uh, where Muslims came to Christ, led themselves or led their own people to Christ in numbers greater than 1,000. In the 1900s, he found 11 of those movements. In the entire, you know, in that entire century, there was 11 movements like that where Muslims led Muslims to Christ. So far in this century, the 21st century, we're in just in the year 2016, there's more than 65 movements of Muslims leading Muslims to Christ. In, in the circles that I operate in now, I know people who are, are familiar with entire mosques converting to Christ, entire Muslim villages converting to Christ in different places in the world. And, um, and that's just in the Muslim world. When you look outside the Muslim world, there are more than 100 
movements of disciple making, which, which just means obedient followers of Christ who know who they are in Christ, so they know how to multiply and create more obedient followers of Christ who will multiply. Uh, one example. There's a gentleman, I'm going to show a video toward the end of our time today, and uh, one of the gentlemen in the video was, um, was involved in uh, church work and planting churches in Kenya. And uh, he attended the training that, uh, that I did in March of 2015, so not even a year ago. When he came to the training, he had about 400 people in his network of, of churches that he had planted in different areas in Kenya. Once they started to implement biblical discipleship, when every single one of those 400 people learned who they are in Christ and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ according to the Bible, then they began to multiply like crazy. As of today, they are over 7,000 disciples. So in less than a year, they multiplied from 400 to more than 7,000 disciples disciples of Jesus Christ. I was just in Africa. I got back two weeks ago. While I was there, that network added a thousand members. I, I got there uh, January 6th and I left on January 20th. And in those 14 days, that network had 6,000 disciples when I got there and had 7,000 when I left. I mean, the guy was just getting texts every day. We're baptizing 100. We're baptizing 20. We're baptizing 50. It's unbelievable because everybody sees themselves as a disciple of Jesus Christ, not just as a Christian or not just as a churchgoer. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a greater uh, responsibility. So this conference today is called uh, No Regrets, right? So I was thinking about what would a life of no regrets look like? If, if you and I get to the end of our lives and we can say, I have no regrets. What would that look like? And, and I actually want to have you guys take a couple minutes. If you have a pen and, and, a, and a paper, just take about three or four minutes and write down what would it look like to finish your life with no regrets. And then I want you to, to a couple of you to share with us. Uh, go ahead, take two or three minutes and, and uh, write down what do you think a life of no regrets would look like. I have one pen if anybody needs one.
those of you who just walked in, everybody's jotting down what it would look like to live a life with no regrets. You finish your life with no regrets, what would, what would that look like? And so I'm giving them four minutes. You have about a minute left if you want to work on it. Love loud alarms. That's right. That's how I get up in the morning. All right. Um, who'd like to share what you wrote? Just uh, two or three volunteers to share what, what do you what do you think? Uh, you finish your life, you're you're entering heaven. Yes, brother. Uh, the path to I from are being verified. Would you be would you be kind enough to stand up and say that again? Because it's kind of hard to hear you. No pass to hide from or be embarrassed by it, and all your civil rights or privileges intact. Awesome. No, no pass to hide from or be embarrassed by that. I love it. Somebody else. <coughs> Don't be shy. I will. <coughs> okay, Mark. Uh, have all my uh, people that I've hurt over my lifetime have make amends with them. Okay, make amends with all the people you've hurt in your lifetime. That's excellent. Yes, brother. Feeling of completion or good standing. Okay, feeling of completion, good standing with, with whom? In regards to relationships with other people or specifically like I'm thinking my kid, my wife, mm -hmm. my grandchildren. Sure, sure. Yeah, good good standing with all the people that you love, all the people that you know and love and care about. Awesome. One more. <coughs> okay, bro. All kinds of friends. Kids uh, knowing Jesus Christ and uh, actively uh, spreading the gospel. Okay, say that one more time. All family, uh, kids, friends, they know Jesus Christ as their Savior and are actively spreading the gospel of Christ. Awesome, praise the Lord. He said uh, that all your friends and your family would know the Lord and that they would be actively uh, spreading the gospel, that they'd be active in this uh, faith that they profess. That's wonderful. I appreciate that. And these are all these are all excellent uh, excellent things. And um, I want to suggest that uh, that Jesus uh, has maybe has something even better. And uh, so let's take a look at Jesus' final commands to his church uh, before he left. When he was about to ascend back to heaven, he gave some final commands so that his people would know exactly what they were supposed to be doing when he left. We're going to start by looking at uh, Matthew chapter 28 verses uh, 18 through 20. Can I have somebody read that for us? And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the day. Awesome. Thank you very much. Now let's look at the Great Commission according to Mark. This is Mark 16, 15. Fifteen and sixteen. Well, we can just do fifteen. <laughs> you have your Bible flipped there, 
and somebody read it when you have it. And you said to them, Go into the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Awesome. Thank you very much. So go into all the world, preach the good news to all creation. And in Mark, he said, go and make disciples of all nations, or again, the whole world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And then let's look at Acts 1.8, also a pretty familiar verse. Another of the final commands of Jesus. Anybody, anybody? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and the Asia. Awesome. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses from Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So, who are we supposed to baptize? From those verses, who does it say we're supposed to baptize? All people. All people. Okay? So, Jesus says, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. So, all nations. So, does that mean we're supposed to baptize every single person that we that we uh, run across as we walk down the street? Just carry a bucket along with you and <laughs> baptize everybody? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Maybe not. What, what did it say in Mark, in the Great Commission according to Mark? Go into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel. That, so you, you use your words to share the message of the kingdom. And then it says... Who is going to get baptized? Those who believe will be baptized. So if you combine those two, we're supposed to go, we're supposed to preach the gospel, those who believe we baptize, but then we teach them how to obey everything that Jesus commanded. Now, how long does it take to baptize somebody? How many in, you, how many in here have ever baptized someone? A couple hands, okay, awesome. How long did it take? 45 seconds. 45 seconds. Somebody else? Maybe under a minute, right? 30 seconds? That's right. That's right. If you go if you go to my YouTube channel, I've got a video. I think it's a one-minute video, and they got two people baptized in that video, and they had to walk in the river and out of the river, and the next person in, and it's just, boom, you're done, move on. So it takes about, you know, 10 seconds, 15, 30, I don't know. But how long does it take to teach somebody to obey all the commands of Jesus Christ? A lifetime, right? Anybody in here perfectly obeying all the commands of Jesus? If you raise your hand, then we're going to trade places. <laughs> so how can you say no regrets? Right? It's impossible. It's impossible. You can't live a life in this earth unless you're God. You can't live a life in this earth with no regrets unless you're God. Is that what you just said? So we should rename the conference? Call it uh, minimum regrets, minimum regrets. <laughs> Tell me how you can do it with no regrets, because how many times have you not witnessed the people that are children and listen to the Christ and you should have an argument with your wife? All of those things, I know that I'll have regrets, mm -hmm. because I can't live a perfect life. Sure, sure. And, and none of us can live a perfect life, and we are all going to have some, some regrets. That's true. Um, obviously, we've got to do the best we can do in the, in the, in the spirit. Yes, brother? I, I think, uh, I think they, 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 they put on a great part of Christ. That's the part of Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, to put you know, those things into Christ and trust in Christ and to live a Christ and live a Christ in life. And that's how we live. Stay Christ centered, Christ focused, and we and that's our mission, then that would help us to live a life of no regret. I think that's very true. That we we live a Christ centered life, that we, we live a life where we are being guided and directed by the Holy Spirit, that we are, uh, you know, Jesus talked about uh, take up your cross daily, deny yourself daily. 
And then you're in the right spirit to be my disciple. He said, you cannot be my disciple unless you give up everything you have. That means you, you, you give up your rights to your own life. You give up your, your, your rights to your dreams, your hopes. You, you live a life that is directed by Christ. And at the end of the day, you have to trust him for the results. I don't know that my grandchildren are all going to go to heaven. I don't know that my own children are all going to go to heaven. I hope so. But I have to be a faithful witness. I have to live a life uh, of Christ, the life that Christ would live if he were in my place. And then, you know, Jesus never forced anyone to follow him. He, he offered that they follow him. So it's the same thing uh, with us today. We live a, a life of Christ. But there are those people who will walk up and say, I'll follow you everywhere you go. And Jesus says, well... Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And the assumption there is that the guy didn't follow Jesus. It doesn't say what happened. But, but you know, that Jesus was telling him, well, you know, I'm homeless, and if you follow me, you're going to be homeless, and you probably aren't willing to, to uh, follow me on that level. So, um, but again, we, we, uh, if we know that we lived the life that Christ gave us to live, then we can live, we can finish with, uh, with no regrets. Um, we can talk more after the session, too, because I'm supposed to be done at 8 o'clock. So we talked about who do we baptize. We baptize those who choose to believe the message. We don't baptize every single person. Obviously, that's not, uh, that's not biblical. You don't see that in the Bible. That's not uh, ever been the practice of the church. But that we baptize those people who believe. And then we make disciples. And you know what? We don't make Christians. Let me say that again. It doesn't say to go into all the world and make Christians. It doesn't say go into all the world and get them saved. It doesn't say make church attenders. It doesn't say make uh, you know people who come and sit in a chair or a bench in the same spot at the same time every week and then go home and nothing changes in the way they live their lives. It's not what it says. It says go make disciples. And so it's important for us to understand what is a disciple. You know, when Jesus used that word, he knew exactly what he meant. And when Jesus used that word, his followers knew exactly what he meant. But today we use that word and we don't know what we mean. And we don't know what he meant. And people throw that word around as if they know what it means. But the reality is most of us don't. Even in the church world, most of us don't know what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus in Jesus' day. I hear that word thrown around a lot. I go into churches, I talk to pastors, people say, oh yeah, we've got, we've got a discipleship program. I was just in, in Rwanda um, four weeks, three or four weeks ago, and uh, I sit down with this pastor and he said, oh, we've got discipleship. I said, oh, you do? He said, yeah, I got a certificate on my wall. And uh, I said, I thought, well, how does that... How does that prove that there's discipleship going on? You got a certificate on your wall. Uh, and it turns out there wasn't discipleship going on, not according to Jesus' understanding of the term. So we're going to look, because that's what the title of this conference or this uh, talk today is about, is Jesus' understanding of the word disciple. Because sometimes we're talking about apples and oranges. Jesus knew what he meant by disciple, but we're talking about something different. Sometimes we're talking about making people better, better church members, which if they were fulfilling the, uh, the characteristics, the mandates of a disciple of Christ, that would be all right. But if we're making something that doesn't look like a disciple of Christ, then we're making a disciple of something else. In Jesus' day, there was as many as a thousand rabbis that were walking around with disciples. You've probably heard this scripture that says, the Pharisees, the disciples of the Pharisees fast, and the disciples of John the Baptist fast. And then they said, Jesus, why is it that your disciples don't fast? See, the culture that Jesus came into was a culture of discipleship. Everybody knew what it meant to be a disciple. You know, I didn't know that. I thought, growing up, I grew up in the Lutheran church, I thought Jesus invented the concept of discipleship. But he didn't. He, he capitalized on the concept of discipleship. 
He came into the world at a time when discipleship was at the all-time high in the history of the world. Everybody knew what it meant to be a disciple of a rabbi in Jesus' day. It's kind of like everybody in this room knows what it is to be a Packer fan. Right? Anybody not know what it looks like to be a Packer fan? If they were in the Super Bowl tomorrow, what would you be doing? Right? Everybody knows. Because you grew up in Wisconsin. It's just the culture. And you know, people paint their houses green and gold. And, and we just know. We wear this certain, on Packer Day, everybody wears Packer clothes. Because that's the culture. We know. Because we grew up in. Well, in Jesus' day, it was the same thing with rabbis and disciples. So... When Jesus called a disciple, when he said to Matthew, Matthew was sitting at that tax collector's booth, and he said, follow me. Matthew knew exactly what that meant. And we have no idea. But that's what we're here for today, uh, is to, to look at what it meant. Because if I don't know what Jesus meant when he used the word disciple, then how in the world can I expect to live a life that fulfills the Great Commission? The Great Commission is go and make disciples. What if I go make something else? Or what if I go make a disciple of someone else? What if I go make a disciple of my favorite author? Or go make a disciple of my, my favorite preacher or my denomination? Those are, those are things that you can make disciples of that are not necessarily disciples of Jesus Christ. So, in Jesus' day, now if you have a notebook, if you have a place to, to take some notes, I want you to draw a picture of an umbrella. So make a big kind of an arching um, you know, arc on the top of your page, and then put a wavy line underneath it so it looks like an umbrella. Draw a long line through the middle like a big tall J. Because the way that this looks, this understanding of biblical discipleship, is we have to understand that it falls under the umbrella of a rabbi-disciple relationship. You may know this already, but the word rabbi is the same word that's used in the Greek as the word for master. And the word disciple is the same word that's used in the Greek for the word slave or servant. So it is literally a relationship where Jesus is our master, if we're his disciple, and we are his slaves, we are his servants. And Paul understood this very well. Paul said, you are not your own. You have been bought at a price. Now think about, you know, the movie Roots or some slave movie that you've seen. You've literally been purchased by the blood of your master. He owns you. And if you understand that, then the characteristics of biblical discipleship make perfect sense. Because you see, we live in the United States, and the United States was founded on the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. And so we think we can have independence and rights. And we have some, but not from God. We don't have independence from him, and we don't have any rights in our relationship with him, because he owns us. We have rights in our relationship with our government. In our civil relationship, we have rights. We can declare independence from England, but we can't declare independence from our Heavenly Father. Does that make sense? Everybody with me so far? Okay, so if you drew your umbrella, the title of the umbrella itself is Ultimate Authority. Your rabbi is the ultimate authority over all areas of your life. He owns you. In fact, there's a verse in Matthew uh, 23. Jesus says, you are not to be called rabbi because you have one master. See? The, he's using those words interchangeably, rabbi, master. And that might be in the interpretation. They just didn't want to use the word rabbi twice because it seemed redundant. So they said, you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one master. They could have said, you are not to be called master, for you have one rabbi. It's the same word in the Greek. Now, when you became a disciple, you were agreeing to five primary characteristics. You were agreeing your life is going to take on uh, new meaning as you follow this 
um, as you follow this rabbi, when you became a disciple of a rabbi. The first characteristic is that you were required to obey your rabbi without question and without hesitation. I love the story of uh, Peter when uh, Jesus tells him how to fish. You know, you put yourself in that position. Anybody in here a fisherman? I know that, uh, Merle, you like to fish. Don't you? <laughs> I saw I've heard. Yeah. Um, Jesus grew up in Nazareth. And if you look on a map, there's no water around Nazareth. And so here comes this carpenter's son from Nazareth, climbs into Peter's boat and tells Peter how to fish. Peter is older than Jesus. Peter has been, he grew up on the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus says, well, if you throw your net on the other side, you'll find some, uh, you'll find some fish. And Peter's like, Lord, I mean, what would you say, right? Are, are you kidding? I, I've been, I worked hard all night. I caught nothing. I got the nets all washed and folded up and, and ready for tonight's fishing. But then Peter catches himself because Peter knows that if I'm going to be a disciple of this guy, if I, because I think he's the Messiah and I want to stay in that disciple master, you know, disciple rabbi relationship. So Peter says, but nevertheless, at your word, I'll throw it on the net. Not because he wants to, but because his rabbi told him to, and he doesn't have the option to question, to disagree, to disobey, or even hesitate in obeying his rabbi. So if we're going to be disciples of Jesus, we have to, we have to analyze our own ministries, we have to analyze our own lives, we have to analyze really everything we do in our, in our spiritual endeavors by, are we making disciples? Are we making disciples according to Jesus' understanding of the term? The second characteristic of a disciple of Jesus was that you were required to memorize all of your rabbi's teaching, and you were not allowed to write any of it down. So, why would Jesus give that command? Why would he say, or why would, not even Jesus, but why would the rabbis in Jesus say, why would they make that a rule? You cannot write down your rabbi's teaching. You have to memorize it. Anybody have any thoughts why that would be? Yeah. So that you practice it, and because you may not always have it on paper or stones when you refer to, I mean, you have to live it then? Yeah. If you, if you memorize it, what were you going to say? I saw another hand. Yeah, same thing. Then it's in your heart, it's in your mind, then you always have it with you. You know, I've got my Bible here, and thankfully I've got a little bit of this committed to memory, but uh, if, if I didn't have any of it committed to memory and I always needed to rely on the book, then I'd always have to have the book with me, and if I didn't have the book, I would be handicapped in my ability to minister to others but by committing it to memory, then I've always got it with me, and I always can um, you know, speak the truth, the teachings of Jesus to other people. When Jesus said in John, when he said, if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you show yourselves to be my disciples, bearing much fruit. See, Jesus is referring to the fact that you've memorized all my teaching. You show yourselves to be my disciples because you can recite all my teaching. But how many people do you know who have endeavored to memorize all the teachings of Jesus Christ? Anybody know anybody who's ever done that? Pretty rare in our, uh, in our Christian circles today. But we need to get back to that. We need to look through the Gospels. What did Jesus command? Am I living according to the commands of Jesus Christ? Is, did, you know, does my life represent Jesus and who he was and the things he commanded? The third characteristic of a disciple of Jesus in his day was that you were required to imitate your rabbi. I mean, imitate your rabbi. So, in our day, are we willing to live like Jesus lived? Are we willing to do the things that Jesus did? Because in Jesus' day, they knew that. They knew the relationship we have is that we become just like you. We do what you did. We say what you said. That's why when Jesus was up on the mountain of transfiguration, a guy brought his son, who was demon-possessed, to the valley below. So you got Jesus on the mountain, 
Peter, James, and John up on the mountain, Moses and Elijah up on the mountain, and in the valley you've got the other nine disciples. And this guy shows up with his demon-possessed son, and he fully expects that the, God, that the disciples are going to be able to cast that demon out of his son. Why? Because Jesus can do it, and you're his disciples, and you imitate him. You should be able to do it too. It's the same reason why Peter answers Jesus the way that he does when Jesus is walking on the lake. Middle of the night, they're in the boat. You know, the 12 disciples, they're rowing, they're working against the wind, they're tired, they're struggling. And, and, and they see this, you know, what looks like a spirit or something walking on the lake. And uh, Jesus says, well, don't be afraid, it's me. But Peter's not so sure that it's Jesus because he says, Lord, if it's you. But see, Peter's testing this spirit that's on the lake, whatever it is, is this a deceiving spirit? Is this something here to trick us? Does, I mean, they've seen some wild stuff in, since they started following Jesus. And he says, if it's you, then you tell me to come to you on the lake. Because you see, Peter knew that the relationship that he was in with Jesus was that I do what you do. If you're standing on the water, then I should be able to stand on the water. And if you're really you, then you're going to be able to make me stand on the water. And if you're some deceiving spirit, then when I jump out of this boat, I'm going to go down. But Jesus had Peter stand on the water because Peter imitates uh, his rabbi. The disciple of a rabbi imitates the actions of the rabbi. And so remember that as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus, because the next part of that story, of course, is that Peter takes his eyes off Jesus, and then he sinks. But as long as we have our eyes on Jesus, we can imitate him. We can do what he did. We can put our hands on the sick. We can see them get well. We can put our hands on lepers, you know, the, the outcasts of society. We can love on the people the world has rejected, because that's what Jesus did. And he will give us the power and the ability to do those things as long as we keep our eyes on him. <clears throat> The uh, fourth characteristic of a disciple uh, of Jesus in his day, and again, I'm telling you these because I want you to analyze your own lives and your ministries and everything you're involved in in, in religious circles by these. Because this is what Jesus told us to do. I want you to go, you preach the gospel, you find people who respond, you baptize them, and then you make them into this. That's the goal. That's the purpose. And you've got to make sure... We ourselves are made into this because you can't make a disciple if you're not willing to be one yourself. So, characteristic number four, you have to agree with your rabbi on the Old Testament. Now, that doesn't sound like a big deal at first glance, but your rabbi would give teachings about the Old Testament. He would interpret the Old Testament for you and you did not have the right to debate with him on his interpretation of the Old Testament. So when Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount, he gives a portion of that sermon in a rabbinical debate. There were, like I said, up to a thousand rabbis in Jesus' day walking around with their disciples, and they were all saying stuff. They were all saying, well, this is right, and this is right. So Jesus says, you have heard that it was said. Anybody... You know, think, uh, does that ring a bell with anybody? You have heard that it was said, and then Jesus names the thing that the other jokers of the day were saying, and then he says, but I tell you, and he lays down the truth. So even though those other rabbis weren't there, Jesus is referring to the stuff they were saying. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye. But I tell you, love your enemies. You've heard that it was said, you know, love your neighbor, hate your enemy, but I tell you. You've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you. Right? Jesus is, is defining the uh, law, the Old Testament, for his disciples. We don't have the option to, to uh, disagree with our rabbi if we want to stay in good relationship as his disciples. I was speaking on these things at a, a church in Wausau. And a guy came up to me afterwards, and he said, you know, I prefer to hate my enemies. And I said, well, why is that? And he said, well, I, I sell munitions to the government. And the more the government is off killing ISIS, the more money I make. 
And I, I just really sleep better at night if I hate those people because I want them to die because then I can sell my stuff and the government buys it and uses it to kill them. And I said, well, you know, you, you have got to decide if you, you know, you've got to decide how that affects your relationship with your rabbi because you are in direct opposition to what Jesus said, which is love your enemies. So if I want to be his follower, if I want to be his disciple, then I have to love my enemies. It's not an option. I don't get to debate with him on that. As soon as I start debating with him on his interpretation of the law, the Old Testament, I jeopardize my relationship with him as his disciple. And nobody would ever want to do that. The uh, fifth characteristic of a disciple of uh, a rabbi in Jesus' day was that you were required to gather more disciples into the school of your rabbi. So, we see this as early as in John chapter 1. Because, you see, it was their culture. So they knew, if I'm a disciple, if I agree to be a disciple of this rabbi, then my job immediately is gather more disciples to my rabbi into his school, into his, you know, teachings. So, if you look at John chapter 1, this is so interesting to me. If you have your Bible, if you don't, read it later. It says that um, there was a couple of disciples of John the Baptist, and Jesus is, is, is walking along, and uh, John says, look, the Lamb of God. So, two of his disciples heard him say this, and they start following Jesus. Jesus turns around and he says, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, uh, where are you staying? Jesus said, come and you will see. So now these two disciples of John the Baptist start following Jesus. It says one of them was Andrew, Peter's brother. And then it says this, the first thing that Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. So initially, the very first contact that Peter has with Jesus is not Jesus calling Peter, it's Andrew calling Peter. Jesus didn't even call Andrew. John the Baptist just said, hey, that's the Messiah, and Andrew started following Jesus. Andrew figured, you know, I think maybe this is the Messiah. I better go get Peter. And then it says, the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Now this is Jesus' first disciple that he actually calls himself. And Jesus said, it says, finding Philip, Jesus said to him, follow me. So now Philip knows, uh, I've just been asked to be a disciple of a rabbi. So that means I'm going to have to obey him, memorize his teachings, imitate him, agree with him, and gather more disciples to him. Well, Peter, or uh, uh, Philip already knows this. So Philip, it says, Philip went and found Nathaniel. And he told him, we found the one in the, in the law that Moses wrote about. And, um, you know, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. You know, you've heard the story. Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Come and see, he said Philip. And he brought it to Jesus. So you see, right from the very beginning, right from the first call, they're thinking, who else do I know who would make a good disciple? And we would do so well in the church today if we would all turn our minds on to think like that. Who else do I know that would make a good disciple? Who else do I know that would make a good disciple? And um, in doing that, that's why we see these movements multiplying uh, around the world so rapidly, because people are living like this, and they are uh, looking for other people who want to follow Jesus Christ. Now, our time is almost done, and I want to finish by showing a video and I want to mention the fact that this needs to begin in our homes. And I'm not just saying that because I think, you know, home is where the heart is. I'm <coughs> saying that because that's what the Bible shows us. You know, Jesus went and he was walking into the city of um, Jericho. And he sees a guy up in a tree. And he says... Zacchaeus, come down. And then what did he say? Did he say, 
I need to lead you in the sinner's prayer and uh, the four spiritual laws right here at the bottom of the tree. No. He said, Zacchaeus, come down. I need to come to your house. And then when Jesus left Zacchaeus' house, he said, salvation has now come to, not to this man, but to this house. And you see that all through the scriptures. When you look at uh, the ministry of, of Peter, Peter goes to the house of Cornelius. Jesus could have sent Cornelius to Peter. Cornelius could have got saved. But that's not how God operates. He wants to win your household. And he wants to win the households of the people who are looking for him. When Jesus trained his disciples in Luke, Luke 9, Luke 10, Matthew 10, he sent them out and he said, look for a worthy person. Look for a person of peace. And when you find them, enter their home and there preach the kingdom, preach the gospel. And we don't tend to do that. We tend to find somebody who's interested and we want to preach it to them right now. Rather than saying, well, how about I come to your house? How about I come and share this with your family? But that's how they operated in the Bible. You look at Paul with, with Lydia. Her whole household got converted. Paul with the Philippian jailer. whole household got converted. Paul with, uh, with um, Justin in, uh, in uh, Acts 19. whole household um, got converted. So we're supposed to finish at 8. I have a two-minute video. You guys, uh, this is... This is Real, um, these are testimonies of people who have had this training and how it's affected their families. talking about the Muslims, I'm thinking that scene and God's not dead. Oh, powerful scene. The movie God's not dead. Oh, movie. right. Yeah. Yeah, amen. My computer shut off. I apologize. i got to turn it back on here. But anybody have any questions or comments as I, uh, as I pull this back up here?